start recording yet. Thank you. The third thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do like a peer review thing where I'd like you to discuss your approach with a classmate and talk about the question that you are drawn to or that you think you might wanna write about in the approach that you'll take as well. Yeah, there's no pressure. And I really want this to be an opportunity to learn from each other and share ideas. And I think that to a certain degree, it can be difficult to, to maintain some of the connections that we establish in class over the long distance that, that separates us. And so this is a chance for us to not just do a peer review, uh, but hopefully you, you'll open up and, and talk a little bit with a classmate about the approach that you'll take and maybe the issues in the class in the, in the topics that are of interest to you. And then that will bring us finally to a class discussion where we can pan out and actually talk about what issues are the most important and what kinds of topics that might interest us, but also maybe the most important to address for any number of, of political or, or, or analytical reasons or reasons that relate to our, our moral or ethical commitments. What I intend and hope for is that this research design and this research process is a chance for you to think about questions that matter to you and that you care about and to address them in a systematic way in this paper. And so the class discussion is a chance for us to talk about some of those things and some of the topics that we might be drawn to and for, for any number of reasons. And so let me give you the text of the research design paper assignment prompt that I've posted under files on CAT courses. Uh, the text of the prompt is as follows. In a paper of 1,000 words, about four double space pages, you will outline your approach to conducting research for the research paper. Address the following questions. What is your research question? What comparative method are you using? And what are the cases? What is your hypothesis and where will the data come from? And so you will be evaluated based on whether you form a research question, whether you form a hypothesis, whether you describe the independent and dependent variables in the hypothesis, and whether you outline a relevant comparison of two or more countries. And I say two or more because you can really do as many as you want technically, but it might be useful to you to focus on a small number, like two or three at the very most, because it's a short paper even the research paper itself will be relatively short, only about 12 pages. And I know that that might seem very long, but when you're collecting information about multiple cases, that really begins to take up a lot of page space. And you'll find quickly that it becomes really a, an issue of making decisions about what to include and what not to include. And so don't be daunted and struck by the writing component, because this is a chance to really engage in a, a creative research process of your own that I don't want to deter you because of the writing involved. The writing is a part of that process. It's the end step in that process. The steps that come before it related to research, the formation of the question, the selection of the cases, these are all opportunities to make choices that really reflect you. And so the, this is your opportunity to make like in any number of, of decisions that will, will then be shared with whoever reads your work. In this case, that includes me, uh, but who knows, maybe you form an interest and you wanna continue this work and maybe you write about something in the future or you even publish work that comes out of this class. These are all possibilities. And so use this as, as a chance to do that while not just completing the requirements for the course, but but also being creative and thinking and making connections of your own and doing so in a systematic way that includes evidence from multiple countries. That's really the goal here. And so the short research design paper, the four page one where you just outline these four things is gonna be due a week from today. Now, this has been in the syllabus from the beginning of class and so the schedule has been clear and we discussed this at the start of class.
what we're doing today is kind of going through a process where we discuss the essential ingredients for the paper and then what an example might look like. And so hopefully you've been thinking already about potential topics, potential questions, countries that you like. The goal has been from the start to kind of do this semester long research process where you're not writing all the time or even doing much work all the time, but you're thinking from the beginning about the topics that you like. And so bring that in, bring in any thoughts that you've had and discuss that with us today when we eventually have a class discussion and when you talk about this with your classmates here in a while. Let me take a look at the chat. Eighty. so you choose the topic that you want. To clarify, this is a paper assignment that involves you choosing the topic that you want to write about and you picking the question that you want to write about and really you forming that question. So let me give you an example here in a moment of what a process might be. <laughs> John, yes, we'll discuss data collection and information here in a moment when we talk about where you can find the most useful information for an assignment like this. But these research designs need to do four things. The first one is, is form a research question. This is really the most important part. Now remember, throughout the course, we've focused on research questions, and we've often introduced new topics and new sets of issues with a series of research questions. We've also used research questions in our discussion of different comparative methods. We talked about how the questions themselves bear a resemblance to the, the nature of the method and the ways that the methods isolate on patterns of similarity and difference. So these research questions are not new to us. We're very familiar with, with the way these things look. And so I want you to, to refer back to that and use that as a resource when you form your question. These questions don't come easily necessarily. It takes a little bit of thinking, but you always wanna begin with a topic that interests you, you know, that moves you, something that motivates you, that makes you want to look more deeply into, into the situation and figure out what's going on. You know, something that really makes you wanna write a letter home, so to speak. That's the thing that's going to motivate you to do really good work and to make interesting and creative points that only you could make because of your you know, particular interest in that topic. And so in my own case, to the extent that I have one, my academic career has been based on focusing on the political economy of civil military relations in developing countries. So ownership and control of defense enter enterprises, export taxes and levies that finance militaries, these are political economy questions that also relate to civil military relations and democracy. And these are especially important questions in Latin America because the legacy of military influence and in politics has left behind a whole range of, of economic institutions that the military either controls or benefits from. And so my research questions have focused on those issues because that's what I care about and what's interesting to me. Why do some countries reform their defense industries while others do not? Why do some countries reform export taxes while others do not? These kinds of questions. The second step and the second thing that a research design needs is a hypothesis. You need to form a hypothesis. This is the answer to your question, or this is the hunch that you have. You know, what is it that you think explains the variation that you observe from country to country or from time period to time period. This is where you begin to think about the theory that you'll build around that hypothesis. That hypothesis is important because it begins to organize the collection of the data. It begins to make you think about the key variables. And that's the next step 
The third thing that your research design paper needs to do is identify the key variables. Now, this follows logically from the hypothesis. When you form a hypothesis, we already know that a hypothesis is testable, it's falsifiable, and it is a statement of a relationship. When we do that, we can very easily identify the moving parts. Those are the key variables. And I'll give you an example here in a moment. And we also have examples from the reading. And we, of course, did the Landman reading. And we've discussed these things quite a bit in lecture, especially during the methods lecture. And then finally, you need to outline a comparison of two or more countries. And so the comparison is really, really important because it's often how you form the question, but it's often also how you outline a, a kind of quasi-experimental framework that lets you support the hypothesis, right? So you use the, you use the comparison to form the question, but you also use the comparison to really support the hypothesis. And so this is the first pro tip or the trick of the trade that I'll give you, which is that there is going to be a link between the countries that you use for your evidence and the research question that you form. Indeed, this is often how we form our research questions. It's also how we often form our hypotheses. And so these steps in the process are not mutually exclusive. They work together. And there's no shame. And in fact, we're inclined and, and, and well positioned and we would benefit from using our cases to form our questions as well as our hypotheses. Then testing those hypotheses that we verify in those cases in larger analyses of more countries later. But in Latin American politics, and when we focus on a smaller set of cases, we often use these comparative methods because they are very useful for studying diversity and the changes across time and space. <clears throat> and the sophistication of the experiences of these different places. And so before we continue and look at an example, let me take a look at the chat. That's okay, Quinn. It was nice to hear the car horn. <laughs> Sandy, it can be any country as long as it's a, it's a, as long as it's a Latin American country. Yeah, so Latin American countries and those can include those can include Caribbean countries as well. But remember that the countries that we've studied in the class have mainly been countries that share a colonial legacy with Portugal or Spain. And so what that means then is that we know the most about those cases and we might have the most information about them too. So those are, those are considerations. When you think about what you wanna write about and the countries that you'll select, we wanna be realistic about the data that you can obtain. <clears throat> Pardon me, everyone, I think I'm losing my voice. Yeah, so Quinn is pointing out that the library gives you access to a lot of great databases this is exactly right. The UC system at large is really, really well stocked and you can get virtually anything. What I'll talk about here momentarily is where you can get good information for a, a paper like this. And what I would encourage you to do is use academic secondary sources, journal articles and books. The reason is because the case studies and the information you'll find in there, it's gonna be high quality and it's gonna already be collected often for a similar purpose. And so we can easily repurpose that and use it for our own purposes. And so I would encourage you to use those sources. Google Scholar is also useful. If you use like the, um, the, the UC Merced VPN, and just log in to the VPN and then go use Google Scholar, you'll get all of the sources linked through Google Scholar that you could get through the library. And so the VPN is a useful way to use Google Scholar to its full effect. And I would encourage all of you to, to, you know, don't shy away from using those sources. That information is there for the taking and there's some real gems out there. <clears throat> 
John, yeah, you can cite research about the Bolivarian Revolution, absolutely, and there's a lot of it. I would, be, I would encourage you to begin with Latin American Perspectives. It's a great journal. Yes, Adi, you can cite other articles. <clears throat> so let me give you an example. Yindi, you can use Mexico. That's a great country to use. Mexico is a large country with a long history. There's a lot of information about Mexico. And in fact, when we talk about Latin American countries, Mexico is often one of the ones that stands out because of its size and because of you know, the experience and the importance of the country. So I would encourage you to use Mexico if you want. Of course, it depends on your question, right? It could be that the question that you like or the topic you like is relevant to Mexico. And maybe you could use Mexico to kind of explore that question by comparing Mexico to maybe a different country. So let me give you an example. Um, you know, if I were to do this assignment and make a research design of my own and write a research paper of my own, what would I do? And to be clear, you don't have to do what I would do, but this is what I would do. And this is an example that you could use as a model because this will contain all the components that you would need for this, uh, this assignment. And this could give you a head start and a way of thinking about variables and cases and so on. So the question that always comes up for me and that I wanna know more about <clears throat> is why do some authoritarian regimes last longer than others? You know, you look out at, at all the, the cases out there and you find that some of them last for decades at a time, like three or four decades. Others are like, you know, six or seven years and they, they collapse. If we assume that all authoritarian rulers want to stay in power, well then it follows that they don't succeed to the same degree in doing so if there's such extensive variation in the survival of these regimes. And so why do some of them survive so much longer than, than others? And why is this question important, maybe more importantly? Well, it's important because Latin American democracies are slowly deteriorating to a certain degree. We know that since 2011, of the 18 countries that share a colonial legacy with Portugal and, and Spain, four have transitioned from democracy to authoritarian rule. Several others are, are sort of weakening. And on the whole, there's a, a clear pattern of democratic erosion. And so the question then becomes, if authoritarian rule is a new reality, well, how long are these authoritarian regimes going to last? And what explains their survival or their failure? This is me acknowledging the nature of the situation and accepting that authoritarianism has once again returned to Latin America and that we now need to examine the potential for bringing it down. We need to examine the survival of authoritarian regimes and figure out, okay, well, what strings can we pull if we wanna bring these authoritarian regimes down that have reared their ugly heads in Latin America? And so my, my hypothesis is that regimes last longer with, with the support of a political party or a coalition of parties. That means if the regime itself enjoys the support of a civilian political party or a coalition of parties, even under authoritarian auspices, that legitimates the regime. That provides them a structural support, moreover, that they can use to exert their power and to remain in power and to resist legally, politically, and, and in other ways, efforts to, for example, bring about recall referenda, elections or pl pl plebiscites that could end the dictatorship through the defeat of the dictator, so on and so forth. So there are good sound theoretical reasons for this hypothesis. And I'll let you know as well, it is my hypothesis. This is, as far as I know, one that hasn't been formed and tested, but I wanna test it. I actually think that this is the truth. And so let me talk more about the cases that I'll examine to try to gather evidence for this hypothesis that I think is the truth. But let me finish with the hypothesis. The other half of it is that without that support 
authoritarian regimes are more vulnerable to change. Why? Well, it's because they don't have a political party or a coalition fighting for them legally to block referenda, politically to demobilize the support for a democratic alternative and to mobilize the opposition and mobilize the support for the regime. They don't have an actor that can go to bat for them and legitimate their rule and point to it and call it acceptable in the eyes of important civilian actors. This is all part of the theoretical story that I think is the kind of backstory for why a party or a coalition might be important to an authoritarian regime. So in this study, my dependent variable is authoritarian survival. And the key question is, how long did the regime last? And with that key question, we can differentiate between regimes that, you know, last five or 10 years at the most or shorter and regimes that last 30 or 40 years. Now, clearly there's a lot of variation and there's a spectrum in between, but the point is with that simple question, we can differentiate between regimes that survive and endure for a long time and those that, that just don't last. The independent variable, the key variable, is political party ally. Did the regime have one or not? And when I say, did it have an ally, what I mean is, is there a political party or a coalition that publicly supports and backs the authoritarian regime? That's it. If there is, that's really important because it becomes essential for political and for legal reasons that I, I talked about. But it's also important because it legitimates the regime. With these questions, we can measure these variables. And these are questions that bear on the Latin American reality because in these countries that are falling prey to authoritarian rule, political parties still exist. And whether those regimes are able to mobilize the support of a party is likely going to affect their survival over the long term. In the countries that I would study to try to gather evidence for this case that I would make, first I would look at Paraguay under Stressner between 1954 and 1989. This is almost 40 years of uninterrupted effectively military rule, although it was a personalist regime under a single dictator. But it stands in stark contrast to my second case, Ecuador, 1972 to 79, just seven years. Very short. The method is the method of difference. I'm examining these similar cases that have different outcomes for clues as to why the two cases vary. <clears throat> and the factor that I find that differentiates them and that I find compelling reasons and compelling evidence helps to explain the difference between them will become the relevant factor. It will become the causal factor. It will become the factor that I can point to and say the evidence seems to support a role for when it comes to the survival of authoritarian regimes. Now I could add other cases too. For example, I could take a look at the case of Chile between 1973 and 1990, and that would be an interesting case to add. I could take a look at <clears throat> cases from Brazil where military rule also seemed to endure for long periods. But I don't need to do that. I can do everything I need to do with two cases. And so in your case, don't overdo it. Sometimes carefully selected cases, a smaller set, can be more effective because after all, we're just trying to test and support the hypothesis. And that hypothesis really just produces two predictions. And so you only need two cases. And so don't overdo it. Let me take a look at the chat. Yeah, Sarah, you can use multiple countries. Uh, and you should use multiple countries, probably two. Marcella says, can a question be, why are rich Latin American countries such as Brazil or Mexico more attractive to the United States than poor Latin American countries such as El Salvador and, and or Honduras? Yes, Maricela, that could be a good question. So are you referring to like US Latin American relations 
in the way that the United States tends to to treat those countries more favorably in terms of policy. I would want you to kind of clarify what the key variables are and, and sort of what is the measure of the US Latin American relation that, that really is important there. Are you talking about foreign policy or, or policy toward those Latin American countries? John says, why are these cases where democratic part of Latin America turns to authoritarian or anarchy? So John, your, your question is clear, despite the, the wording, um, which you acknowledge is a little funky. All John, you're asking is, you know, why are some countries transitioning from democratic to authoritarian rule? Yeah, so why, is, why did Nicaragua transition from democracy to dictatorship? You know, why did Venezuela transition from democracy to dictatorship? while other Latin American countries did not. So these are questions that are important and that obviously are relevant and contemporary and timely. So in addition to questions about the survival of authoritarian regimes, we wanna ask questions about why they come about in the first place, especially when democracy has already been in place in a place like Venezuela for really half a century. Maricela, yes, so the resources the U.S. can take over. Undoubtedly, there's an important role for the natural resources and the potential for investment in places like Mexico and Brazil. And so just talk about what that would mean, right? And, and what you mean by, by those resources and how that maybe is reflected in politics or policy. Christian, so is there a connection between the strength of Latin American democracies and rights and activism of minority groups? So, very interesting question. I think that's a, a question that I'm, I'm hoping you're wondering about yourself because that's a question that you can figure out, right? That's an empirical question. You might look into, for example, you know, are, are Latin American countries more protective of minority groups if they are more democratic? And are more democratic countries better at promoting the rights of minority groups? Is it the case that minority groups in the activism and the mobilization of minority groups is a factor in helping to explain democracy or the survival of democracy or the, the extent of freedom or liberty enjoyed in a given Latin American country? Christian, these are all interesting renditions on your question. And so with Christian and with everyone else, I just encourage you to be open to what you're interested in and think about the different ways you could explore that. Think in terms of independent and dependent variables. In my case, my interest is in authoritarian regimes and authoritarian survival. And my, my, my theory, my story focuses on political parties. These are things that I'm interested in. But these are also things that bear on the, on the Latin American reality in places like Venezuela and Nicaragua. And so our questions are analytically and politically important. And I don't want you to forget that when you make these decisions and you think about what you're into. What we're into is often what we're motivated by. And that's okay. And in fact, what I said before remains true. You should focus on what you're motivated to, to talk about because then you're inspired to do the best and the most creative work. And it could be that there are some questions meant for some of us and some questions meant for others, other, others of us, just to say that maybe we're better positioned and more interested in some questions and maybe we're more capable of, of, of contributing in that area. And so focus on what you do well and what you like. Eighty. so I'd like you to focus on Latin America. The United States is part of the Americas, but we want to focus on Latin America because so much of political science has kind of a U.S. bias. And too often Latin America is only understood in terms of comparisons to the U.S. And so that's one thing that we should try to avoid. 
Yeah, Ishan. So Ishan says, can a question be the role of, of the implementation of ISI and how it had affected the economies of the countries afterward? Of course. And so you would want to think about, well, what are the indicators that ISI may have impacted? Growth, levels of debt, you know, these kinds of things. Maybe if there are political variables that you think were also affected. In general, thinking kind of mechanically and systematically about ways of measuring or kind of capturing what you're thinking about and what you envision in your head. Christian, so for example, the DV would be the strength of a democracy and the IV would be the rights of minority groups. Yeah, so you could, you could absolutely look at it from that perspective because then you would have a creative and interesting argument that says that, look, the capacity for minority groups to exercise civil and political liberties and rights can strengthen a democracy and can solidify democratic institutions by demanding that, that democratic institutions be accountable and responsive to minority groups, by helping to improve representation. I can think of a lot of ways. Now the interesting question becomes, how do you get those minority, those minority groups rights, those rights for minority groups before democracy itself is strengthened? And maybe part of the answer is that the strength of those minority groups, how well organized they are politically and so on, can help to bring about the creation of those rights, even in environments that are not that democratic. But Christian, your, your question is really interesting and you've got the variables right there and it's a way of thinking about it that's useful because it focuses on important, important topics, right? The rights of minority groups in democracy in Latin America. These are issues that are so important and along with inequality and corruption, along with strengthening democratic institutions and state institutions, that is a very important issue. And so this goes for Christian, it goes for everyone in the class. I want us to think about what is important in Latin America, what matters, you know, what really moves the dial in the region and use our insights and our knowledge and our interests to arrive at, at those, those points about what matters. Yeah, Edie, so just try to focus on Latin American countries. Yeah, Jet, so if you're interested in how um, American interventionism affects Latin America, that's totally within the purview of the course because U.S. Latin American relations is part of the course. It's just that we don't want to study the United States for its sake, right? This is really a question about how U.S. intervention affects Latin America, right? What are the, the effects on Latin America? of US intervention. And so that's an interesting question because it's a historical question, but it's also one that's contemporary and it raises questions about what forms do US intervention take? We know, for example, that the Trump administration has intervened in Venezuela and a very complex and sophisticated situation is, is really intensified in its complexity with something like that. And so, Yes, that is an interesting question that bears on the, the Latin American experience. I would encourage you to think about that if that interests you. The question arises, where should our data come from? What should we be doing to collect this information? Well, I would encourage you to start with academic sources, journal articles and books, and the reason is because the case studies done by other scholars will almost always contain the information you need. And really, I would encourage you to, to try to find everything that you can there. And, and the reason is because not only will it contain what you need, but it's peer reviewed and it's rigorously reviewed. And the journals that it appears in with, with exceptions, but in, in many cases are respectable and authoritative. There are many good journals, for example, in Latin American politics, 
if you go to Google Scholar and type in journals Latin American politics, you'll get a list of them. You can also access them through the database online with UC Merced Library. But start with those, because those are the places where you'll find neatly organized information, often well written. You just need to be open to finding it and looking for it. Now that means then that you need to think a little bit ahead of time. The research design paper itself does not require you to present data. You don't even need to say anything about where the data will come from beyond you'll use journal articles or books in newspapers to the extent that you need to. But the research paper itself will involve, of course, gathering data or evidence that supports your argument from these types of sources. And so you'll want to begin thinking sooner rather than, than later about where to get this information. But news, newsletters and newspapers can also be useful. So one source that I like a lot <clears throat> is Latin News. It's basically a, a newsletter that publishes an intelligence report each week, one for the economy, one for security and defense, one for politics, all these different areas. And this is really reputable information. And it's a very respected and, and old source in the timeliness, in the continuity in the publication is such that it's a very systematic source. And so it's a source that I like to use when I need it. You may not need it. And I don't encourage you to look any further than you need to look to get what you need. This is about finding what you need and getting out. Don't overdo it. Find what you need in secondary sources. If you need to, turn to newspapers and newsletters. But if you can't find everything that you need in those secondary sources, I do want you to stick to primary sources like newspapers or newsletters because there's a lot of crap out there, as we all know. And not only that, but it, it's too easy to just defer to whatever we read um, on the internet. And so try to use reputable sources, newspapers of record, use domestic and national newspapers for Latin American countries, this is often a great place to start. If of course you read the language and you want to and you feel like it's necessary. Abel says, could I possibly do a research paper on why have left leaning, leaning parties movements been unsuccessful in Latin America? So Abel, you could. What's interesting is that during the commodity boom and really beginning in the early 2000s up until about the mid 2000s teens, left-leaning parties really dominated Latin American politics. And it was an interesting time, but they've been on the out since about 2014, 15, when a, a sort of right-leaning set of parties came in. So the record is a little bit more nuanced, I think, but I think you could write a very interesting paper about why left-leaning parties have been unsuccessful in the last half decade after having so much success so continuously for almost a decade and a half. You might write a paper about right-wing parties and why they've been more successful. These are interesting angles to take because we'll talk about parties later in the course. And parties in Latin America, as we know, have tended to fall along three lines. There's the sort of socialist left-leaning variety the kind of conservative uh, variety and uh, often more moderate parties or centrist parties, sometimes called Christian democratic parties. Yes, Adi, you can talk to me after class. Carmina, so you do wanna quote the sources if you use a direct quotation. You can use any style you want as long as it's consistent. I personally like Chicago in footnotes because I get to see the source and you can also use the space to add any additional information that you want, but you don't need to do that. You don't need to follow my preferences. APA, MLA, both acceptable. Chicago is acceptable. Just be consistent. And really, I think realistically, we often end up with kind of a, a hybrid of some 
form because the the formats change so so frequently i think that the best rule is just be consistent with the style that you use only quote directly if it's a piece of information that comes directly or you're quoting uh, an art the article itself like a, a quotation um every piece of information or evidence evidence so to speak should probably be quoted or 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 at least cited so i should say um but again don't overdo it in my experience a couple citations in a paragraph is is sufficient you know even if much of the information in that paragraph comes from those two sources so now i'd like to begin to take a moment and just kind of pull back and I want you to take a moment and pull back as well. And I'd like us to think about the following questions. You know, first of all, what interests you? And can you convert that into a question? What topic motivates you or moves you? And can you make that into a research question? And then what does your gut tell you is the answer to that question? What does intuition suggest is going on here? This is a key question because it begins to get to the hypothesis. But don't think in those terms right now because I want you to think in terms of what we know and can feel already just being here. Third, what are the moving parts in your story? As you begin to piece together what your gut tells you, what are the moving parts? in that causal story? And then finally, what countries could you study to gather supporting evidence? Where could you look to begin to obtain or gather the information that you would need to support this, this argument? And so let's take a few minutes, let's take five or six minutes, maybe 10 minutes. And I want you to, to maybe write things down you don't need to turn this in, but what I want you to know is that this can help you get started on this paper. And so though you don't need to turn things in, it could really benefit you to write stuff down and to engage these questions because this will help you get a handle on it. Of course, you can message me in the chat if you want, but let's take about, let's take about 10 minutes and really engage these questions. <clears throat> 
All right, everyone. Thank you for taking some time to think about this. I've already heard from a number of you through the chat. A lot of really interesting questions out there. Some of you are interested, for example, in women's rights. I'll tell you that there's a lot of variation across Latin American countries and the degree to which they protect and promote women's rights. Uruguay is a country that's very good and is very advanced relative to some other Latin American countries. But there's the other side of the coin too. Um, some Central American countries are far less protective, just to give some of their examples. What's interesting too is that issues like the role of women in legislatures also relate to the quality of democracy. And so Latin America is an interesting place that lets, lets us study a lot of these new and important issues that have been understudied in the past. And so it's a chance for us not just to study things that matter to us, but that really bear on the, the Latin American reality and the, the literature as well. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about what you want to write about and what topics interest you. Um, you know, I had this, I had this in mind for the peer review, but I don't think we have enough time. And I think I want to discuss this as a class and talk about some of the issues and some of the topics that we are drawn to. And I think really most importantly, what questions and what issues should we be writing about in a class like this? I already mentioned that I think that women's rights is a, is a vitally important issue in Latin American countries. Questions like, can women access credit? Or are there laws that protect their rights to any number of reproductive services? These are important struggles that are taking place now but what should we be writing about and what should we be interested in and what really is most important? This is where we begin to think about the responsibility we have as scholars and as students and what we can do to contribute to the debate that's taking place. And so what do you think? You know, what issues should we be writing about and what do you want to write about? What topics do you like or are you drawn to? Brenda says, why are there countries that have a low class uh, poverty group? So Brenda, it sounds like what you want to know is why are some countries poorer than others and why, why do some Latin American countries remain underdeveloped relative to others. And so that's a question that you could take on if you want. Many of you have an interest in what appear to be economic questions, and this is, this is fine. I wanna encourage you to tie it to politics. And so if that means using um, some political variable to explain the variation or explain the outcome, so be it. If it means that you use an economic variable to explain a political outcome, so be it. This is Latin American politics, but Latin American political economy is part of Latin American politics in a general sense. And so I want to encourage you to study questions that, that are interesting to you, but I do want you to tie it to politics. Joel says, maybe the correlation of women, women's rights and humanitarian violations or sex trafficking. Yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting perspective and question. Is there a relationship between the extent to which women enjoy rights and liberties and the extent to which there are humanitarian violations or sex trafficking? Do societies that better protect and promote women's rights 
also do a better job at preventing sex trafficking and, and human rights violations and humanitarian violations? Interesting question, obviously relevant. I think that the issues of human development, bodily integrity, reproductive rights, these are really important issues that clearly relate to the Latin American experience. We're talking about countries that are oftentimes in the grip of political struggle over the shape of these rights and whether they'll exist at all. Argentina, for example, over and over and over again, they've gotten close to passing bills that would legalize abortion, but they haven't yet crossed the finish line. That is a struggle that continues. Now, maybe there's someone out there in the class who's interested in reproductive rights in Latin America. And maybe you would be interested to find out if there are Latin American countries that have successfully legalized abortion. I'm gonna admit that I'm ignorant on this issue and I don't know the experience. Although my hunch is that if there are any, there are very few because the legacy of the Catholic church is very profound. And it obviously is one of the biggest impediments to advancing the, the agenda on reproductive rights. But this is still an issue that you can take on and study in other ways. And so don't be deterred if you don't find the variation that you hoped for. I would encourage you to study the topic that you like. Carmina says, the politics of intersectionalism in Latin American countries, haven't, haven't thought of which two countries yet. Yeah, so you can talk about what that intersectionalism would mean or what it looks like in different countries, right? If you could form a research question, it could become a more empirical investigation just in the sense that we can organize the study in a way that focuses on a, a question, right? A kind of driving curiosity, something that motivates the, the study and, and shapes the study. John says, the current revolution that happens in the lead compared to another, another country. Quinn says, maybe like how is the advancement of human rights in Latin American correlates or doesn't with democratization? Yeah, so are democracies better at promoting and protecting human rights? Are dictatorships more repressive or are they more apt to violate human rights? Yeah, these are very measurable variables that obviously are very relevant because the continued struggle between democracy and dictatorship is also a struggle between often rights and liberties and accountability on the one hand and repression on the other. And so human rights is part of this discussion We'll talk later in the course about not these issues per se, but issues related to the quality, the quality of democracy will come up. And those issues do often relate to accountability for past abuses committed under the former regime. Carmina says, L L L Q LGBTQ rights and activism in LA countries. Yeah, so is there some variation that you observe? You know, why is there more activism and why is that movement or are these activists better organized in some countries than in others? Do you observe, for example, that there are mass movements in some countries, but not in others, or that there's simply more activism in some countries, but not in others? You know, why is that? What would explain the variation in activism? You know, do you think it's related to the strength of political parties? Uh, do you think it's related to um, maybe you know something about the democracy or the electoral system? Who knows, right? It could be anything. These are things that we'll talk more about in the course, some of these things that I've mentioned, but that's an interesting question. Um, and I think Janet is interested in that too. And, the question then becomes, how do you measure activism? It's not difficult to measure. We can measure it in terms of protests, the frequency of protests, 
we can measure it in terms of the duration of protests or the actors involved. We can look at it in terms of the support that activists enjoy in political parties or elsewhere in society. You can think about activism in terms of the size of groups that designate themselves as activist groups, right? Their membership, how many people do they have? How big is their budget? And so on and so forth. And so think creatively about how you wanna measure these things. And really the advantage of studying a few cases is that you can use a very thick set of measures, meaning you can look at different ways of measuring it. You can look at more than just frequency and duration, but also you know, numbers of members. You can look at their alliances or their support from political parties or other groups. You can look at all those things and that becomes part of the picture. Ishan says, I want to write about ISI because it's, it is fascinating to me that there was an entire set of economy that took over the regimes across the region and it's a big part of the legacy today. Maybe I could dot, maybe I could use the implementation of ISI. Oh, I could tie the implementation of ISI to political stability in the country. Totally. Yeah. And you can talk about how ISI, where it was implemented most extensively, seemed to give rise to the, the biggest crises of all, and in turn, maybe popular mobilization against the regimes that sponsored the models, um, maybe a lot of socioeconomic crises, these kinds of things, right? Different ways of measuring political stability and thinking about political stability. Maricela says, healthcare within the indigenous people, especially since the older people didn't grow up seeing a doctor or they believe in home remedies than medicine. Yes, Maricela, so that's a really interesting topic because in countries like Ecuador, the majority of people are indigenous. And so some of the issues and challenges of extending healthcare to a larger and larger radius of, of people is overcoming um, more traditional thinking that might serve as an obstacle to treating people or giving them healthcare. It's interesting to note that the World Bank has been involved in efforts to promote development in Ecuador in indigenous communities through trying to influence ways of thinking about medicine, and in particular, ways of thinking about medicine for newborns, not just the elderly. Uh, but Ecuador is one case, and you could look at many cases. Yeah, Brenda, so political corruption, really interesting topic. Political corruption is a kind of a way of doing business in a lot of Latin American countries, but not in all countries. So some, so some countries are more corrupt than others. And so the question might be, you know, why are some Latin American countries more corrupt than others? Does it have to do with regime type? Does it have to do with maybe practices that were set in motion at critical moments in time? Who knows? It's an interesting question. Are democratic regimes in Latin America less corrupt than dictatorships in Latin America? Different questions, different ways of thinking about the topic. Joel says maybe the poverty in correlation with education in Latin America. So does poverty serve as an impediment to educating the population? Are poorer countries also less educated? And I think the challenge is obviously teasing out um, well, the, the, the line of causation, but we also wanna to remember too that we wanna to relate this to politics as much as possible. And so do you think that there might be certain types of political systems or types of political regimes that better reduce poverty or better increase levels of education? Can you compare Latin American countries to try to figure out if those patterns hold in the ways that you expect? Samantha says, I want to look into how drug cartels have changed the political situations in Latin America, more specifically, Colombia, Mexico, and Central American ports. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And later in the course, we'll talk a little bit about narco politics. And one interesting way is that 
Latin America has benefited, I won't say benefited, let me, let me start over. <laughs> the United States has financed enormous drug wars in Latin American countries, including Colombia. And that money has often been an important influence in politics, and it's often had an impact of its own. But it's also the case that groups like the FARC, which have in some cases been linked with drug trafficking, but aren't necessarily involved in that extensively, have made an imprint on politics because of what they've left behind when these civil wars come to an end. It mainly, you know, political parties or movements that still seek representation and an improvement in, in, in land distribution, primarily in Colombia. There are other ways of thinking about how drug cartels affect politics. It's really interesting to think about the United States and their role, as well as just how it affects Latin American countries. Adi, you can talk about two countries' economy. You want to think about, again, how you can tie politics to it. Agla says, would military interventions count as Latin American politics? Yes, absolutely. If it's a military intervention in Latin America, like in Nicaragua, between 1901 and 1933, of course. I'm not too sure if it is at all. I think it was mentioned in class where some individuals were chosen and placed in positions of power because of this. Would it be possible to connect that to Latin American dependency? Um, certainly, if you find or, or think that military interventions into Latin American countries were designed to keep in place systems of dependent economic relations, remember though that we didn't talk a lot about dependency theory in the class. I think that you can certainly use that, but it might involve some heavy lifting from the point of view of thinking about the, some of the theoretical um, parts. But I think that sounds great to me. And that's a question that doesn't tie as, as exclusively to Latin American politics because there's no political variable in there uh, with the exception of the military interventions. But that's fine, and that sounds interesting. And those military interventions were clearly designed to maintain a system of economic relations that benefited ex external powers. Carmina says, for intersectionalism, can the question be if there's a significant political difference between the livelihood of Afro-Latinx Afro and white Latinx in the two Latin American countries? Yeah, and if you think that there's a political variable that differentiates the two, that might make it more interesting. Um, good, if there's a significant political differences between those, good, yeah. What is that difference? Is there something that, that separates the two and distinguishes them? That would be really interesting. We'd want to know more about that. Yeah, so Maricela adds, activism can, can be looked at as the way that people organize themselves and gain support from different factors, such as religious groups, the community, and even their political leaders, totally. Yeah, so all of those things really matter. Hey, these are all great ideas. I'm really happy to see that you're all thinking creatively and about what matters to you because you're gonna be in the best position to make creative points about what inspires you and what you like. Good, Samantha. So Samantha says that I'm interested also in seeing how and why education in Cuba and authoritarian regime has very low Ill literacy rates compared to other parts of Latin America. Also very good, um, well, health coverage in a very supportive health system for an authoritarian regime. And those are interesting things about Cuba that set it apart and are inconvenient facts for a lot of, <laughs> a lot of the hawks in the United States who want to maintain the embargo. Cuba is an example of social and, 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 and socioeconomic development under an authoritarian regime and under communism in Latin America. We don't talk enough about Cuba, but it's clearly an example of an experience that does distinguish it, for instance, from the Venezuelan case where just a few years of dictatorship have shown that education levels have plummeted access to healthcare has plummeted. And so, Samantha, to your point, it's interesting to point out that in Latin America, dictatorships don't always preside over these kinds of gains. The examples of Venezuela and Cuba show that Cuba is quite unique in this regard. 
And I think that you could further look at countries like Nicaragua to see how the descent into authoritarian rule there has also meant often a decline or at least a, a sort of flatlining of some of these, these measures. Listen, everybody, we're out of time. Uh, very, very happy that we did this. I wanted to do a change of pace and help you to start thinking about this. I hope that you're feeling motivated to do this and write about what you like and what matters to you. And so thanks for being here. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now. Hang out and ask me questions or make comments if you want to. Um, but I do look forward to, to doing more of this and of course, reading your writing and reading what, about what you wanna write about when you, when you get around to it.